Revelation chapter 1, verse number 8. We're continuing our series, The Revelation. We've been talking about how we, John painted a picture of Jesus here in this first chapter of this book that is so oftentimes misunderstood. It's made, made out to be confusing. It's made out to be scary. But in reality, it is just John giving us a picture of, of who Jesus is, has always been, but most importantly, who he's about to be seen by as the in the world around us. And we've learned that Jesus is the faithful and true witness. We've learned that he's the firstborn of many brethren, the first begotten of the dead, the first one to rise from the dead, and that he has put that resurrection power in us, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in us by and we have power and authority and because of that he said he washed us by his own blood that he's made us kings and priests unto our God and then last week we learned that he is the king who is coming again that someday very soon Jesus is going to return to the earth today I want to go into that next verse and I promise you <coughs> Next week, we'll probably begin to move a little more quickly through this chapter because right now we've been getting stuck on a verse at a time. Next week, I'm going to read several verses. But this week, I want to read just one more verse here in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 8. It says, this is Jesus speaking again. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I am the Alpha and the Omega. It's a very empower, powerful phrase that Jesus invokes here that maybe we may not understand on face value. If you've been around church, you probably have heard this, con this concept before. But if you've never been around church, if you're not someone who understands the Greek language, then you may not understand what he's saying here. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek, Greek al alphabet, it is A. And omega is the last letter, it is Z. And Jesus is making the statement, he's saying, I am both the beginning... And I am the end. And interestingly, if you continue through the book of Revelation, there are four times in this book that Jesus appears to John and identifies himself as, I am the Alpha and the Omega, which lets us know that this is a title that he does not take lightly, but it is a title that he recognizes has great significance to us as to revealing who he is. The words contain no deep hidden mystery. They simply mean, I am. I am A and I am Z. But I want to take a few moments for it together and look at what that literally means. And, and I'm going to give you a little disclaimer. A couple of things about this sermon. First of all, this is going to be a very long introduction with a very short sermon. It's going to take me about 25 minutes to introduce the subject. It's going to take me about 5 to 10 minutes to preach the application. So if you, if you hang with me. The second thing is in this introduction, there's going to be a lot of information. I'm going to be sharing a lot of things. It's going to be a little bit deeper than I normally would go on a Sunday morning. So I want you to get ready, buckle your seatbelt. Put on your wading shoes because we're going to get out in some water together, okay? I don't want you to take off your nice shoes because we're going to get wet. Alpha and Omega speaks first and foremost of his glory connected to his humility. Let me explain that. The word Alpha suggests that Christ is the best. He is better than all who came before him. And if you put all others together, he stands still head and shoulders above them all as the best. Well, let, let's kind of find out how we know he's the best. Well, was he a son? Of course. He is the firstborn, the first begotten, the only begotten, the eternal son, the only perfectly obedient son. All other sons are made to be sons by faith in him who is the son. He's the best son there ever was. Well, well. Some say he was a prophet. Is he a prophet? All other prophets stand behind him by an infinite distance and point to him, bearing witness to him. Well, well was he a priest? 
he, all other priests are only types of him. Their only purpose was to represent him until he came. He is the fulfillment of them. He is the great high priest of our profession. He is the greatest priest. Well, is he a king? Indeed, Jesus is a king like no other because he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Well, then is he a foundation? Yes, he's the tried and proven foundation, the only sure foundation. Those who build upon his foundation shall never fail. Well, is he a cornerstone? Well, of course, he is the chief cornerstone. Well, is he a rock? Yes, he's the rock of safety and refuge, the rock of salvation. Is he water? Well, yeah, he's the water of life. Is he bread? Yes, he's the bread of heaven. Is he light? Yes, he's the light of the world. Is he a refuge? Yes, he's a sure, eternal, saving refuge for our souls. What am I saying? It doesn't matter what title you try to put associated with Jesus or what character he may assume. He is in all respects alpha. He is the best. He infinitely surpasses all that may be compared to him. As the sun excels the stars, so Jesus excels all others. Because when the sun arises, the stars fade in its light. And when we lift Jesus up, everything else loses its greatness and its power when you recognize that he is Alpha. But then we recognize that in an almost completely different vein. He, he's alpha. He's better than everyone. He's greater than everything. He is by himself in a class all by himself. But he's also omega. He is the last and the least. You see, this same Jesus who has no one who can compare to him, no one who can contrast him, no one who can compete with him, said he thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was obedient even to death, even to the death of the cross. What am I saying? I'm saying he who was preeminent was willing to humble himself to no longer sit on the throne in heaven where he belonged but rather to come to the earth to wrap himself in human flesh to become like us to live the life that we live so that he could be a sacrifice that would release for us the ability you got to understand the alpha became omega he became the less than so that we who are the less than can become more than that's what it meant when he said, I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. It means I was born the least, but now I have the authority and the power of the most because the Alpha became the Omega. He who was greatest became the least, so I who was the least can now walk in... Pictures for us his glory and his humility. He is Alpha and Omega in a three different ways I want to show you very quickly this morning. The first of which he is in the Bible, he is Alpha and Omega. Christ is Alpha because he is the beginning for the first line of Genesis speaks of him. In the beginning, God. John would put it like this. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. And the Word and out of everything came the Word. He was the beginning. In Revelation 22, 21, the final verse, the final line says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. He is the beginning and the end of the totality of the Word of God. And He's everything between the beginning and the ending. Every book of the Bible, every chapter, every verse, every sentence, every word speaks about Jesus. If you could squeeze the entirety of the Bible down to its very essence and substance, what you would find is Jesus. Because the purpose of the Holy Spirit moving men to write the scriptures was to reveal to us who Jesus was. That is the only purpose for the Bible. And the Lord himself said concerning the entire volume of scriptures, they testify of me. Well, you say, Pastor, I don't know about that. Well, let me help you. Let's go. You ready to go through the Bible? We can go through the Bible in the next 95 to 100 seconds. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman. 
In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet greater than Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's the rebuilder of our broken down walls of our lives. In Nehemiah, Jesus is a restorer. In Esther, he's an advocate. In Job, he's the ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. In Song of Solomon, he's the lover of our souls. In Isaiah, he's the Prince of Peace. In Jeremiah, he's the righteous branch. In Lamentations, he's the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the glory of God. In Daniel, he's the everlasting God. In Hosea, Jesus is the forgiving husband. In Joel, he's the giver of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he's the builder of the city of God. In Obadiah, he is our Savior. In Jonah, he's the firstborn of the dead. In Micah, he's the ruler of all ages. In Nahum, he's the avenger. In Habakkuk, He's the God of our salvation. In Zephaniah, he's our savior. In Haggai, he is the restorer of the kingdom. In Zechariah, he's the priest on the throne. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wing. Now let me take my breath. We'll go to the New Testament. In Matthew, Jesus is the king of the Jews. In Mark, he's the servant. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the giver of the Holy Spirit. In Romans, he's the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he's the giver of gifts. In 2 Corinthians, he's the triumphant one, giving victory. In Galatians, he's the liberator of our souls. In Ephesians, he's the head of the church. In Philippians, he is our joy. In Colossians, he's the head of all things. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he's our hope. In 1 Timothy, he's our faith. In 2 Timothy, he's our stability. In Titus, he's truth. In Philemon, he's our covenant friend. In Hebrews, he's the message of the new covenant. In James, he's the great physician. In 1 Peter, he's the cornerstone. In 2 Peter, he is our purity. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he is love, light, and truth. In Jude, he's the one who's able to keep us. And in Revelation, we see him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm telling you, when it comes to the Word of God, Jesus is Alpha and Omega. You get anybody want to talk to you about the Bible and not talk to you about Jesus, they don't understand it. The entirety of the Word is about Him. He is Alpha and He is Omega. Well, if He's Alpha and Omega concerning the Word of God, let's look at concerning the law of God. He is again Alpha and Omega because He is the lawgiver. He was the beginning of the law and He is the fulfillment of the law so He is Omega because Romans 10.4 said the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes on Him. If you would see the law fulfilled, you cannot look to men. Recognize that throughout Old Testament history, There were many heroes of the faith. Hebrews 11 tells us of all these mighty men and women who served God in the old covenant and did the best they could. But there's one problem with every last one of them. None of them fulfilled the law. Every one of them failed at the law. Moses was God's friend, but Moses failed at keeping the law. Abraham was the father of faith, but he failed at keeping the law. David was a man after God's own heart, but boy did he ever fail at keeping the law. No one could do it but Jesus alone. He alone honored, kept, and fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law's requirements perfectly as a man. He loved God with all his heart. He loved his neighbor as himself and in death he satisfied the law's justice, removed the law's curse and penalty from us and put an end to the law's covenant. Our Savior obeyed the law as the representative of God's elect and died under the penalty of the law as our substitute and his obedience has imputed to all of us who believe righteousness. Because we are in Christ, we are not under the law in any sense whatsoever, but we are under grace. Mm. 
What does that mean? It means we seek holiness, but we never have to trust our holiness. Get a hold of that right there. It doesn't mean I do whatever I want to do because when I fall in love with Jesus, I want to live life the way He wants me to live it. And I seek to live holy because He is holy. But I don't get up here this morning in the confidence of my holiness. I get up here this morning in the confidence of His holiness because when it comes to the law, He's the Alpha and He's the Omega. He satisfied the law. He fulfilled the law so I don't have to be afraid of We seek to live in righteousness, but we never imagine that we will attain righteousness. We seek virtue, but we never look to our virtue for merit with God. Our saving and only sanctifying righteousness is that which is found in Jesus because He is the beginning and the end of the law. The the law demanded perfection. But it cannot demand, nor can it have, greater perfection than you and I have through the imputation of Christ's righteousness. You have to understand that. You can't be any holier than you are the moment you trust Jesus to be your covering over your sin. It doesn't matter how hard you try. You can't improve on that perfection. You're covered by the blood of Jesus. The law demands satisfaction, but it cannot require nor can it find greater satisfaction than we offer in the blood of Jesus as our substitute. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega of the law. So thirdly today, and this is I'm getting down to where I want to get. Christ is Alpha and Omega concerning your life and destiny. Jeremiah, I'm going to read two passages of scripture for you. They'll be on the screen. Jeremiah 1, 5 says this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. This is Jesus speaking to Jeremiah, telling him that, Jeremiah, I didn't meet you on your birthday. In fact, Jeremiah, I didn't meet you at the moment of your conception in your mother's womb. Jeremiah, I knew you before your mom was born. I saw you before you were even a possibility. And I knew who you were. I want you to understand today that Alpha, Jesus, is the beginning of all life. And he's the beginning of your life. And here's the beautiful thing about that truth. He doesn't make mistakes. I love medical science. It does amazing things. But one of the unintended consequences of our present level of medical science is we have created a concept in which we think we control life. And therefore we have created certain terminologies that are just not true. Terminologies such as unplanned pregnancy. There is no such thing as an unplanned pregnancy. Now mama may have not been planning on it. Daddy may not have been planning on it. But every pregnancy has been planned. Because the author of life is our creator God. And every life that is born, that is started on this earth, comes from Him and has purpose, has meaning, has reality. Now I know there's some folks that say, well, Pastor, I don't believe, I don't believe in all that stuff. I, I, I'm going to hold on to the strong scientific nature of evolution. You go ahead, go ahead, hold on to that. But you say, I'm crazy, you say, I'm a person of faith. Boy, it takes a lot of faith to believe there's a creator. I'll tell you what, it takes a lot of faith to believe. That out of nothing came everything. It takes a lot of faith to believe that a protoplasm somewhere in the middle of the ooh and goo billions of years ago somehow started to figure out how to be better than it was and eventually that evolved us into who we are today. That takes a lot of faith. You know what doesn't take a whole lot of faith? To look at my body, to look at my fingerprints that are mine. You don't have them. Nobody else in the 8 billion people on the earth have these fingerprints to understand that maybe, just maybe, there was a creator who formed and fashioned me just the way I am 
him for a reason because he knew who I was before I was and he knew who he saw me becoming and who he saw me being and so he made me the way that I am for a reason, for a purpose and it just don't take a lot of faith for me to believe that. Makes a lot of sense to me. Why I hate the concept of evolution, the concept of unplanned pregnancy, is because it has created an entire generation, in our country especially, of children and teenagers who think that they don't belong here. They think that there's no reason for them to be here. That they're an accident. That they're a mistake. That they're a failure. That they're no good. I come to tell you this morning, listen, if you hear nothing else I say this today, understand that you are on purpose. God knows who you are, knew who you were going to be. He created you. He formed you. He fashioned you. He loves you. And He has a plan for you. Because this is what Jeremiah would say later after God spoke to Jeremiah in in chapter 1. Then Jeremiah relates to us in chapter 29 another thing God said to him. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. To give you an expected end. He said, I knew you before you were born. And I've already got a plan for how you're going to end. I am both the Alpha, I was at your beginning. I am your beginning. And I am Omega because I've already been to your end. The end of the introduction right there. Now let's get to the sermon. So where, why then if Jesus is all powerful and yet he humbled himself to make us into his image... If Jesus is the beginning and the end of the entirety of the Word of God, if Jesus is the beginning and the end of the law of God, and if Jesus is the beginning and the end of all of creation, then why doesn't everything Jesus intends to happen, happen in everybody's life? It's a good question. Because what we've been talking about up to this point is a strong, spiritually, biblically backed doctrine of the sovereignty of our Savior. That Jesus is God, that He is in control, and that He is sovereign, and that He is in a class all by Himself. But there is a separate truth that runs parallel to it that seems it's hard for me mentally to do the theological gymnastics to understand how both of them can be true at the same time because Jesus is sovereign but we have free will Jesus has control of the entire universe but what he won't do is take control of you. And so while the things that are happening in the totality of the universe are going to ultimately come to the full fruition of His plan, your part in the situation, because He was Alpha, He will be Omega, but in between there's a dash. And two things happen between his beginning of you and his ending for you. Those two things that happen are this. First of all, Satan gets a chance. It is in this dash because you were formed in eternity. Your plan concludes and comes to fruition in eternity. But when you let out that first scream as a baby, you had entered into time. The dash. We know it differently. I'm talking about it in the concept of Jesus being Alpha and Omega. But we know it in the concept of on your tombstone, there is going to be a date of birth and a date of death. And there's always a dash in between. It's amazing because when you look at your obituary, when you look at your tombstone, the two dates are what make up most of the time. But in reality, for most people, where the real, the, 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 the most of the time is spent in the dash. It's in that moment between beginning and ending what happens after I was born, before I die. 
that dash opportunity. And it's in time that there here Satan is in time. And he has the opportunity to tempt us and try us because God has given us a free will to choose. Why did God give us a free will to choose? That's a great question. In fact, it's one I would like to argue with him about sometimes. Y'all are real quiet right now. But do you realize how easy my job would be if people didn't have free will anymore? You know how many times, you, you have no idea how many times I've sat in my office counseling with someone who's having a problem, knowing full well, for sure, if you'll do what I'm telling you to do, this is going to go away. And then them go home and not do what I told them. It's so frustrating, but it's the price of free will. God knows what's best for us, but he so desires relationship with us that he refuses to force anything on us and the only way you can know if someone truly loves or cares for you is if they have a choice. You want to know how I know that my wife loved me before we got married? It's because I wasn't the only guy trying to get her phone number. Come on now, I, I would hate to enter into a marriage with someone and the reason why I was marrying them is because they said there's nobody else on earth I can get to like me. Because let me help you with that, that's not love. And there's a real problem with that. What if somebody comes along and decides they like them? Because if my commitment to you is just because there is no other option, then I don't love you, I'm just using you. And God said, I don't want a relationship where you use me. I want a relationship where you love me, where we have relationship together. So I'm going to give you free will to choose. And so Satan comes, it, found, it started in Genesis, it's continued to today. He comes down into time and he takes an opportunity of us having a choice and he begins to take his chance to tempt us to do something other than what God wants for our life. And over and over and over again, he will make Make us wonder about what God has said. That's how he did it in Genesis 3. It's how he still does it in 2024. He comes down and he says, did God really say? Did God really say? If you haven't watched our culture evolve as a nation with the basic reason why there's so much evolution happening, especially within the American church, it's because we're asking this question and this question alone. Did God really say? We've stopped listening to the Word of God in its fullness and we've started questioning, did He really say that? I mean, is there any way we could do some theological gymnastics to jump our way out of saying that maybe culturally that's a cultural, because that's the beautiful thing about the Word of God is if you study it, there's some things in it that are very much just cultural. But there are some things that are so not cultural. They are truth that stands the test of time. And our problem is when we begin to let the enemy get in our ear and start asking us, did God really say it? Because Satan takes his chance because he knows that we have a choice. We can choose to follow after God's plan for our life or we can choose to do our own thing. And therein lies the greatest problem because God created us with a purpose. God has an expected destiny for every one of us. But the reason why so many people never get from being created with a purpose to walking into the fullness of the destiny God has for them is not because Jesus couldn't do it in their life and it's not because they couldn't accomplish it. It's because when Satan came and tempted them, they chose to do their own thing. The problem with this concept of Jesus in my life's beginning and end is that it does not matter how much he has planned the end from the beginning. He will not force my, the end on me if I do not choose him in the dash. If I do not allow him 
to be Lord of my life in between the beginning and the end. How do I get to the expected end? It's very simple. You make Jesus Lord of your life. You surrender to His will, His plan, His way in every way in your life. And when you do, He will bring you to the expected end. I'm almost done, but let me close with this. What I love about the grace of God is that Jesus creates us with purpose. He has an expected end for us. And in the middle, Satan comes and gets a chance to disrupt it. We get a choice which way we're going to go. And can I help you with something? Because some of you may feel real bad today. Romans tells us that all of us have chosen wrongly sometime. I, I, I need to help you. Jesus is not bodily in this room. And due to his bodily absence in this room, there is no body in here that has not made the wrong choice. Now, there's some people in here who'd like for you to believe they've never made a wrong choice. But come talk to me afterwards. I can probably list off ten for them by myself. And I'm, I don't even know them that well. I'm just, you know. We've all fallen short. We've all messed up. So, so what, what, well, if I'm created with a purpose, with an expected end in plan, and the only way to get there is to follow the will of God, well, what about when I messed up? Does that mean that every time I make a mistake or a misstep that I forfeit a level of the destiny that God has over my life because I got out of line, I got, out of, got off the plane, and so there's some things I'm... That would be law. But remember, Jesus did away with that. So now we're under... You say, but boy, I, I've really messed up a lot. Well, Jesus said something about that. He said, where sin does abound, grace does much the more. See, what grace does, I remember, I remember, I, this is going to date y'all. Uh, me, it's going to date me, sorry, it won't date y'all. <laughs> I mean, if you understand what I'm saying, it dates you. Uh, but I remember 30 years ago, almost 30, well, it'd be, what, 20 years ago. I'm a teenager, 17, 18 years old, traveling evangelist, and I started traveling on my own. And I went to some far-flung places in this country, like uh, went to South Carolina and Georgia all by myself, 17, 18, or, well, 18 and, and there was no GPS on our phones. So the, you know how you got, and, and I'm talking about, I went to some like backwoods places. You know how you got there? This is how you got there. You got on the internet, and you waited for it, ding, 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 dial up, and you went to MapQuest, and you put in starting point, intended destination, directions. And after about 20 minutes of loading, you got this 12 pages that you could print out, and you did because you had no other way to keep because you didn't have it wasn't gonna come on your phone. You printed out twelve pages of directions, and it'd take you from your doorstep to the doorstep of the next place with detail every turn you need to take. Problem was, if you missed the turn, all of your directions are irrelevant now. That's law. That's how the law was. When you stepped out of line, too bad for you. There's nothing you can do. But I'm thankful for the upgrade. Because traveling has become a lot easier for me. Because now i got GPS on my phone. And I type in where I want to go. And as I head out that way, there is, there is sometimes that bless her heart, she tries to tell me what to do, but she doesn't do it on time. Y'all ever, and, and when I say she, I'm not talking about my wife, I'm talking about the woman in the phone. Not that she isn't also trying to tell me how to drive. She's just not telling me where to go, she's telling me how to get there. The little lady on the phone will say, turn right, and it'll be too late for me to turn right. 
Oh no. If I was back in MapQuest, I'm in real trouble now. Because how am I ever going to get back on track because I messed up. But you know what GPS starts doing? It starts going rerouting, rerouting. Now all of a sudden I'm still going to get there. It's not going to be as easy as it would have been if I had gone the original route. It's not going to be as quick as it would have been if I had gone the original route. It's gonna, it's gonna, there may be a little bit more difficulty in the turns. I may have to take a few more turns. I may have to do a couple of things that I wouldn't have otherwise had to do. But the truth of the matter is I'm still going to get where I was going because of the GPS repositioning and rerouting. And that's what happens when Jesus, the alpha of my life, heads me towards my intended direction and I'm following his will, then I step out of line, do something stupid. He doesn't go, well, too bad. He goes, rerouting. That's what grace does. It reroutes. What I love, yeah, come on now. That frustrates me that I didn't think of that first. He says, what I love about it is this. When you go through that reroute, you get there. And there's been a couple times. I'll be honest with you. I've done GPS, missed the turn, went the wrong way, whatever, got rerouted. And I decided at the end of the time, I think I like that way better. It seemed like it was almost easier to get there this way. That's the power of grace. Is I'm going to tell you something. God never intended for you to get that addiction. It's never in His plan for you. But if you'll let Him put His grace on you, when you get to the end of your life, you'll look back and you go, my goodness, how would I have ever got here if I hadn't... That's the power of grace. The power of Alpha and Omega working in your life in the dash is He'll take your mistakes and make them look like they were purposeful, like they belong, because He's still going to get you where you're supposed to go as long as you will allow Him to be the Lord of your life. Stand with me all over the house today. Thanks for watching this word today. I hope that it challenged you and I hope it gave you some practical application for how you can follow Jesus more effectively. If by chance you're watching and you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, let's do that right now. If you just pray these simple words with me, the words aren't magic, but what you're saying, if you believe in your heart, it's going to change your entire life. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe you are a savior. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. And I declare that you are the Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I will follow you to the best of my ability. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we are so excited because you just began the first step of an amazing journey of following Jesus. But one thing's for sure, you can't do this alone. You need community. You need a church family. So please reach out to us. Let us know you prayed the prayer and we'll give you some next steps about how you can follow Jesus and continue in your faith. Thanks for watching today. We love you, and I hope you'll come back and watch again next week when we have another word that I believe will minister to your life.